the PFL preview card. Five title fights, two non-title fights, and with a lead-in from a title fight. This is going to get interesting. Let's see how it went down. Our first featured fight of the night turned out to be our last prelim fight, as Jesus Pinedo defeated Gabriel Braga by T. Kill early in the third round. Now, there's many angles to consider here, notably that this was a rematch. At the start of the season, Pinedo lost his opponent, and Braga actually took this fight on 24 hours notice, and he won a very, very close split decision fight. Then, both fighters showcased an impressive performances leading up to this rematch. Braga boasted a 12-0 record coming in, while Pinedo had won 6 of his last 7, with his only loss coming to Braga. The, this bout was back and forth, with both fighters giving as much as they gave. However, Pineda seems to give a little more in each exchange. And this could have been an exciting 5 rounds, but unfortunately the referee jumped in when he thought Braga was a little bit too hurt. Uh, Pineda unleashed a flying knee that rocked Braga, he hit him with a nice little combo, but P Braga was pretty much covering up. He wasn't taking much damage. Uh, from the ref's angle, probably looked worse than what it was. But you know, we get you know instant replays. We get nice TV footage. We get to see all that. Referee gets only one chance. Uh, I'm really excited to see how these two fighters you know go forward from their career from here. Really interested. They're both young. Braga only has one loss, and now Pineda gets to fight Pitbull. Now Pineda's 27 years old. He's got a lot of growing to do. He's actually kind of meeting Pitbull at just the right time of his career. Pitbull's 37, a little slower, still a great fight fighter. Not that he's washed up or anything. I'd still actually favor him to win that fight. But you got to think that he's he is getting a little bit slower. And with Pineda coming in like, like a blitz, I mean, my man is all action. You're not going to get a boring fight out of this man. It's not like he's going to fight Pitbull and you're going to be like, oh, I don't want to watch that. That's one of those I'm tuning in no matter what I'm doing. So they got me excited with this Bellator thing because outside of these two fighters, you're not really looking at two. I mean, you got a few fighters in PFL and the featherweight division that could be exciting, but none of them are exciting as these two. These were the right two to get in here. This was the... Even though the fight was ended early, it looked like this was the outcome that was going to come. Very interesting in these fighters happening again. I mean, we got to have a rematch. But this was a good way to start the card off. Good way to send it in from the prelims onto the main card. And the vision, which not the deepest for um, PFL, but is exciting. Especially with these two. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say that it was all uphill from here. We had some peaks, but we also had some valleys. We'll get into that later on when we talk about some of these other fights. Our first fight kicking off the actual pay-per-view portion was a downer. You had the PFO's latest signing in Derek Brunson defeating Ray Cooper III by unanimous decision. Now... Two of the three judges actually scored two of the three rounds a 10-8 for Brunson. And while they were mostly all somewhat dominant rounds for him, they were only dominant because Ray Cooper didn't get off much. Brunson never did any damage while he was on top. And this was more about Cooper being out of shape than Brunson being dominant. Cooper actually came up from 170 in order to fight Brunson at 185 and he still missed weight by a pound, even with the one pound allowance. This seems more like a guy who maybe because he had a little success and maybe because he's got some personal problems, just really isn't invested in training anymore. Now, there was a scary moment for Brunson when he got rocked, but he was able to transition that and in directly into a takedown. Uh, and after that, he pretty much realized he can get a takedown anytime he wanted, and there was just no danger in the rest of the fight. Brunson pretty much took him out at any point in time that he wanted. Now, Brunson was actually going to go to 205, because Bellator didn't have, PFL doesn't have a 185 pound division. But that's one of the great things about them buying uh, Bellator, is that now they'll have that division. But with this performance, I'm not really interested in seeing him fight any of the top fighters. Dan Hardy was trying to get him to see if he wanted to fight Evelyn. I I'm not interested in it. Uh, he, maybe he could be like a bar to see where fighters are at, to see, you know, oh, he can beat Derek Brunson, this gatekeeper. 
But he's more interested in calling out Jake Paul, a fight that clearly isn't going to happen. Unfortunately, this actually fight started a big stretch where you just had a lot of fights where you can see there isn't much depth in the PFL, which is why they needed to buy Bellator and why Dan Davis actually, Don Davis actually said they needed to buy Bellator because they need that depth. And man, this showed exactly why. Our next fight was a featured catchweight fight at 150 between Aspen Ladd and a returning Kayla Harrison after a year absence following her first loss. I think we first gotta put some shine on Aspen Ladd here. She came into this fight on short notice after Julia Budd had to pull out, hence the reason why we even had the catchweight fight to begin with. In her last fight, she looked amazing at 145. However, with a full camp, I would still have to pick Kayla Harrison here just because of the way that their skills match up. Ladd is a bruiser who wants to get in close, rough you up, take you down, and then beat you up on the ground. The chances that she's going to be able to do this against Kayla Harrison is just very low to begin with. So when you got to know, so you got to know where the bar is at for when you can be judging things at. Coming in on short notice against a bad matchup and giving all and giving that kind of performance just needs to be applauded. Never once did she ever give up, no matter how bad a position she was in and how much she was getting punched in the face on the ground. Both of these fighters have some work to do on the feet. Kayla is a little bit more crisper, but, Ad, but Ladd was landing some big punches of her own and they had bad intention written all over them. Even on the ground, she made some killer work here. At one point, she actually got her back. No, that wasn't like a long lasting situation. She didn't really threaten her, but there was a little moment of some tension right there. Now, Kayla looked pretty impressive. She was trading for Julia Budd, and I think that would have been a better stylistic matchup for what she tried to do right here. The issue is that you just can't see her going much further than she's already gone. She's set in her ways, and while what she does, she does really well, you gotta look who's coming down the pipeline for her. They aren't paying her a lot of money just to have these kind of meandering fights. So for now, she's really only be fighting on pay-per-view cards where you can get the most bang out of your buck for her. And the fight against Julia Budd that was supposed to be on pay-per-view was really just a last minute fight just to get some more eyes on, the, on this card. The issue is you just don't have any women who are on her, on her level or with her name value. So what you really have is you have two possibilities here. If Harrison fights twice next year, then she's gonna be fighting against Pacheco and against Cyborg. But you're gonna run into some issues right there. The first issue is that the PFL wants to put on a champions versus champions fight versus Bellator. If that's the case, then Pacheco will have her first crack at Cyborg before Kayla does. That would eliminate one of those fights. Obviously, you could still do both of them, but some of the shine's gonna be off, especially with the Cyborg loss. But most likely, if that fight goes ahead, you really just seal the Cyborg versus Kayla fight because the chances of Pacheco pulling it off are pretty low. And I think if that fight happens, because that's the fight that PFO wants to put on, that's most likely going to be the last fight of both of their careers. Cyborg really has nothing left to do or to prove. She's looking at trying to box at this stage of her career, and outside of the Kayla Harrison fight, there's no one in MMA left for her to fight. Her boxing may also be the reason why the unification fight between Pacheco may be on hold. Now, if Kayla wins, she's a superstar. I see her going on for lots and bigger and better things. The issue is, I just don't see a way for her to win. She's clearly a novice on the feet, and the judo isn't going to really work against Cyborg. A lot of judo is technique, but there's a huge component of just natural strength. And there's a reason why Cyborg is one of the best women on the planet, if not the best women's fighter of all time. Kayla's not going to be able to set up any of her takedowns with her striking. So instead, she's going to get in close and try to force her down with her power. That's not going to happen against Cyborg. And unfortunately, I don't see Kayla sticking around if she gets embarrassed by Cyborg. The, P the PFL already had to sit her out for a year because they didn't have anybody else for the fight. The UFC won't be interested in her with a Cyborg loss. And there's just not much to do. And she's already been completely retirement after the first loss because of that. But if she can actually pull off a win against Cyborg, the sky's the limit for Kayla Harrison.
A knockout that could change your entire career. Fighters look for that sometimes for their entire career. Kasingane, well, he was able to find that. He was just on the other end of it. When I say Joaquin Buckley, Kasingane is the man that you think of without even knowing about it. He's the one that caught Buckley's leg and received a beautiful spinning back kick for his good defense. Even though he was an up-and-coming fighter with a 2-2 record in the UFC, the UFC just didn't really see much for him after that. Fast forward a couple years later, and now he's the PFL champion. This is as much as you need to know about the competition in the PFL right now. Kasingane definitely has potential, but he's not championship material in either UFC or Bellator. More importantly, he's not a light heavyweight. The PFL got rid of the 185 pound division, so fighters hate to choose to go up or go down. This actually worked out in his favor for this fight, as he was just too big of a man for Josh to take down. And that was the real story of this fight. Josh was very one-dimensional, and he had no second option once the takedowns fell to work. From there on out, it was just a five-round, one-way Aspen. This actually sets him up for a fight with Nimkov, which I really don't have any interest in seeing, as I don't think it's going to be a long, long night here. Nimkov is one of those fighters on a whole nother level and could compete with the light heavyweights in the UFC. And as good as Kinsinaway looked in this tournament, it's just no competition there. This is why PFL getting the Bellator brand is going to help them out tremendously. I mean, that's kind of a theme of this last card right here is just how much better the PFL is going to be after all those fighters get to come over. Here we had another matchup where it was a rematch. This time it was Magomed versus Sai. Now traditional thought would be that if you had if Sai could just stop the takedowns, he'd have a pretty good chance on the feet. But this was a perfect example of how if you blend in your takedowns with your striking, so that even if you aren't getting the takedowns, your opponent still has to worry about those takedowns, leaving you compromised to his attacks. That's just how this happened here. Magomed kept the pressure on and kept attempting takedowns even though Sai did a great job at stopping him from actually securing them. He'd able to get him down, but Sai would get right back up along the fence, making sure he couldn't take him down. But it still left him vulnerable to the big winking shots of Magomed. Magomed was eventually able to hurt him and secure a jumping guillotine for a win. While I wouldn't say it was a blowout, it was a clear one-way traffic in this fight. This now leads to him with the fight with Jason Jackson, once the one that I'm actually excited for. Jackson was able to stop the takedown from Amosov, who I would say was a better takedown artist, but Mega Med is a better striker. Out of all of the PFL versus Bellator fights, this is the one I'm most excited about. These two have trained together in the past, however, even though they're pretty cool drill, they're not one of those fighters that you have to worry about not going in there giving them all or not wanting to fight each other. These two guys are competitors, and as you saw with Jackson's win over Amosov, he can do some pretty impressive things. Really excited for this one. That's the one that should headline. Obviously, the name value isn't there, but man, you want to talk about skill for skill? I think that's going to be the closest fight in that competition. Here's a fight that was actually a lot closer than I thought it would be. Not in terms of the final judges scorecard, as it was a clear Pacheco win. However, it was a lot closer in each round because Marina just came to fight. This was not a lamb being led to the slaughter. This was a girl who was outmatched that had a great chin and used every second of the 25 minute fight to try to make something happen. There were moments in the fight where if a scramble just went the right way, you could see that it had changed the entire fight. The fact that it didn't just says so much about how good Pacheco is instead of anything about Marina here. Pacheco is the best fighter at 155 outside of Harrison. If those two fought 10 times, Pacheco would probably win 2 or 3. That may not sound impressive, but it is. Harrison's techniques are just kind of the perfect matchup for Pacheco, but Pacheco is still just really gritty and tough. In the last fight, it was about being, it wasn't about being better than Harrison, it's about wanting it more. When the fifth round came, both fighters came out to fight, but Pacheco just came out determined to win, and Harrison just wasn't. 
The issue at 155 is there's just literally no one outside of Harrison. The issue at 145 is that there's only Harrison and Cyborg. But this is a woman who's in there at every fight and has a chance. Now, I wouldn't bet on her, but she definitely has a chance. And I'm not sure if she's actually going to be fighting Cyborg next, but if they want to make that Cyborg versus Harrison fight. But a Julia Budd or a Kat Zingano, that would be a great fight to keep some momentum. And let's see how this pans out for her. This is why heavyweights are so great. If you asked me how this fight would go, I would tell you that it's going to go one of two ways. Galtsov was going to be coming in, throwing some big bombs, or Ferrer was going to come in, take him down, and beat him up on the floor. But the thing with heavyweight MMA is, I would immediately have to stop myself and say, there's always a third option, which is any time one of these two connect, the fight can just be over immediately. And that's pretty much what happened here. Unfortunately, it's not really much I can say outside of this was an entertaining fight. Both fighters were probably hoping that this would lead to a fight with Francis and Gano, which it just isn't. And the PFL is paying Francis way too much for him to fight someone that no one knows. That's why they're trying to talk into the talk Deontay Wild in fighting a mixed rules fight. And that's also why they're not really worried about booking a Francis and Gano fight. It's potentially later on in the year as they're trying to find someone noteworthy enough for him to fight. They want to find someone that they can actually challenge him that people would know. The best hope is that for these two fighters is that they can't find anyone for Francis and Ryan Bader actually takes the fight against the winner. When they talk about Ryan Bader afterwards, he didn't really seem too interested in fighting Ferrer. He's also looking for that Francis fight. But I don't really think he's going to get that either. So a Bellator fight between Francis and Gano and Ferrer that's great for both parties. If they can't get someone big for Francis to fight, one of the best things they can do is put up a poster with Francis Ngannou versus a fighter with the PFL and the Bellator belts. Now, it's not going to do as good as a Dante Wilder fight, but that could potentially actually put some butts in the seats and sell some pay-per-views. You want to talk about a fight going the exact opposite way a promotion wanted to go, this is that fight. While Mercier was non-committal in the cage in his post-fight interview, backstage he confirmed his, that his plans is to retire. So now you have the new PFL lightweight champion out the door. On top of that, the lightweight champion, Uzman Nurmagomedov, is injured and won't be ready to fight until next summer. So you have the PFL champion gone, you have the Bellator champion on the shelf, and oh yeah, their most exciting, popular, and homegrown star just got beat. When Clay Collard was their idea of the next lightweight, and they were really hoping that he'd get past Mercier. So now you have both champs out and their biggest starting division on a downturn. The only thing about this whole situation that is actually good was that this was an amazing fight. These two went back and forth, and the whole time for the first four rounds... Going into the fifth, it seemed like Collard had the, all the momentum, but Mercier just showed that he wanted a little more. Collard hit him with a good shot in being in the fifth, but that actually led into Mercier's transition into a takedown where he stayed for the last four minutes. While the last four minutes definitely took the air out of the room, when a million dollars is on the line, sometimes you just got to do what makes you win. That's actually the best part about the tournament, is that while it does benefit those in the beginning who have spectacular knockouts to advance, at the end of the day, all you got to do is win. I don't know where the PFL is going to go from here, and they definitely got the work cut out for them. They want to compete with the UFC. But this was the last fight before the merger actually comes in, and the quality actually gets better. So now I'm very interested in seeing what happens in the foreseeable future. With the combined rosters and their expansion to other territories where they're trying to get younger fighters, I'm excited where this league is going to go. <laughs>